Sometimes mistakes are perfect teaching moments. So how did I make that phone do that? What did I do? I spoke, right? And when I wanted to turn the light off, I did it again, right? But that time it didn't work. Well, that's because I was relying on technology. So all those things we talked about where when you speak, then something happens. For us, for mankind, for, for boys, girls, men, and women, when we speak, if something happens, it's because of, like, technology. Did you know in the Bible, in particular, oh, damn, hand those out one. In particular, in the very beginning of the Bible, somebody speaks and a lot of stuff happens. So let's find out. It's in Genesis. And I'm going to paraphrase, so just hang with me. God spoke, and there was light. God spoke, and there was sky. God spoke, and there was land. God spoke, and there were plants. God spoke, and there was the sun, and the moon, and the stars. God spoke, and then there became fish and birds of the air. God spoke, and then all living creatures, all the animals, and then God spoke, and mankind was created. God spoke, and something came into existence out of nothing. What's the difference between when God spoke and like when we speak and the technology does things for us? What's the difference? We're just relying on technology. Yeah, I mean, we have to have something to do. I mean, like something has to do it for us, right? Does God need anything? Like if God speaks, does he have to have something in order for something to happen? No. Just the power of God's spoken voice. The power of God's word. How do you hear God's voice? Prayer. Who else? What's another way you hear God's voice? No, 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 no. Oh.
church. <laughs> I have learned to love you the last three months. And I told Tom, man, if I were younger, I'd stay here in a heartbeat. <laughs> so thank you for letting me be here and work with your children all the way up to the senior adults, of which, of course, I'm not one. But <laughs> it's been so much fun. Let's stand together and sing this wonderful hymn now. We are called to be God's people.
future Susan on our hands. <laughs> Thank you, Kyle. It's wonderful. We come to that part of our service every Sunday that is such a blessing to all of us as we intercede those that need us by prayer. And so if you will listen to those that we are naming today, Dr. Glenda Camp, Harold and Susan Hall, Greg Henson, Larry and Linda Johnson, Trina, Terry, Sylvia and Nikki Tuck, Elizabeth Walters, Jack Engel, and Jeb Wallace. And then we want to extend sympathy to Regina Barton and family in the recent passing of her husband, Doug, and also to Jenny and Rick Moyer in the recent death of Jenny's aunt and sister-in-law, Joyce Hope and Jenny. You probably have those on your heart that you need to pray for. So for the next few moments, if you'll just lift these people up and ask God to answer the prayer, whatever it is.
I'm not sure I really want to turn. <laughs> After all that, how impressive, how truly impressive uh, the children are. But they're impressive because they come from families that are present and love the Lord. Amen. It's just a, it's a blessing for me to be here and worship with you. I'm going to start with a story, and then I'm going to launch into what I want to share with you today. And uh, I want you to know that the story I have to share is a relatively emotional one, and I'm one who tends from time to time to be that way. And if you were here Wednesday night, you know that happens, and it's not by design. It's just that's what God does, and, and He works with us like that. I want to begin with a, a story about Johnny. Little Johnny was having trouble at school, second grader. He began to tell tall tales. They were even, well, he was lying is what he was doing. You can call it tall tales, but, but he was just lying. That's all he was doing. And, and the teacher became concerned about that because she didn't feel like it was really something that, that should be allowed to continue. So she spoke with her principal and he said, listen, the next time he comes in here and tells one of those tales, send him to me. And then I will tell him such a fabrication that he'll be getting to be able to see by comparison how ridiculous what he's doing is what it is. What it is. And so Johnny missed Monday at school that week, came in Tuesday. And on Tuesday, the teacher asked him, Johnny, where, where were you yesterday? He said, well, I went fishing with my father at the little pond behind our, our house, and we caught 150 fish this long. <laughs> And she said, Johnny, you know that pond's too small to hold 150 of anything, much less fish. How many fish did you really catch? And did you really go fishing? Oh, yes, we went fishing, and I caught 150 fish this long. And she said, listen, Johnny, I want you to do something for me. I, I want you to go to the principal's office and talk with him for a few minutes. Would you do that? Yes. Have any of you ever been sent to the principal's office? <laughs> you know, it's a very slow walk. <laughs> to the principal's office, and finally he got there, and the principal began to talk to him. He said, Johnny, come on to my office and sit down. I want to tell you something that happened yesterday that you missed, and you should have been here because it was just amazing what happened. A bear got away from the zoo, and it came to the play yard where all the kids were playing, and the, the bear just scared the dickens out of all of them. They were on the swings and everything. They, they got off the swings and the merry-go-round. They rushed at the, into their classroom, screaming and yelling and carrying on. The bear followed them in there, and, and, he, and he scared them to death into their classes. And then he smelled the food in the cafeteria. And so he went to the cafeteria and went down the food line and ate everything that was on the steam table. He ate everything in the kitchen. Everything he ate, everything. And he scared the little... Uh, cafeteria with ladies halfway to death. And then he came into my office, scared my secretary, and all of a sudden, this little chihuahua about this big came running into my office, scared the bear into the closet, went into the closet with the bear, and ate him all up. Now, <laughs> now Johnny, do you believe that story? And he said, yes, I do. That was my dog. <laughs>
So scripture is certainly part of that and should be a very basic part of everything that we do as we draw closer and closer and closer in our relationship with Almighty God. But it's a, it's a day-long, hour-long, hour-by-hour uh, experience sometimes. We're just constantly aware of the presence of God. And it's, a, it's, a, it's an amazing experience when you begin to feel it and sense it. I've had people ask me the question, well, how do you know that it's God that's speaking and it's not just something you eat for lunch? Well, you know. You know when you're in the presence of the humans, when you're in the presence of the Almighty, when you're in the presence of the Holy Spirit, you simply know. And so what looks like a coincidence becomes providence. And you can call it what it is. We look at God in our lives in such a way that we can understand it. My life has sort of followed a pattern like that, though not deliberately, certainly early on. But recall, when God speaks, things happen. God spoke to Abraham, and things changed. God spoke to, to Moses, and things changed. God spoke to the disciples, and instantly things changed. God spoke to Paul and things changed. My experience is something like those. Early days, I was born and raised in a Baptist church. Not literally, but it could have been. And, uh, and, and grew up in, in, in the church. Uh, my exposure to Christianity really came through my parents and my grandparents to a point. And so that, that was sort of what I expected and we were always in church and, and I learned you know, all the Bible verses and some of the songs that you heard this morning, all of that was part of early experience. And then as time passed, um, I, uh, by that time, I was in high school, sophomore, junior. And one summer, living in Hawaii, we, our church, Kailua Baptist Church, had a, a vacation Bible school experience in the little town of Waimanalo. And those of you who have traveled in Hawaii probably know in Hawaii where I'm talking about. Waimanala was just a little, a little country town. And we held a two-week vacation Bible school, and at the conclusion of that period, the, the students that I was teaching, these were primaries and juniors, most all of them made professions of faith in Jesus Christ. They accepted the Lord, they trusted Him, and they were baptized. And I had something to do with that through that teaching, and I thought, this is the most wonderful thing in the world. I like this. I like the fact that somehow I'm sharing the gospel, and it's making a difference in people's lives, and they're making decisions for Christ, and that's the most exciting thing in the world. And so I went back to my folks and told them what had happened. They, they uh, celebrated the event, but uh, I, I made the, the comment, I, I think I would like to do this as a, as a lifetime thing. I think I'd like to be a pastor. I'd like to be in the ministry and do and do this kind of thing. And my mother was all for it. My dad said, you know, crush the Air Force officer that he was. He said, oh, you'll never make any money doing that. Just, just forget it. And at the time, I was in, I was headed towards a medical career, pre-med and all that sort of thing. And science was the greatest thing in the world. And I read everything I could read and, and studied everything I could study and did that. Well, that wasn't going to happen. Uh, I burned my eyes in a solar eclipse, looking at it like I shouldn't have, shouldn't have more protection, but didn't have enough. And so I felt like, well, the world does not need a blind doctor. So I just didn't go in that, didn't go in that direction. And so life unfolded, and I took a course in political science at the University of Hawaii, and then followed that up at the University of Richmond with a degree in political science, which doesn't really lead you much to anything. And then went to graduate school in Carolina, got a master's, and then had a career in public administration as the county administrator and the city manager, that, that sort of thing. In fact, I really had the greatest experience of life was being the county administrator here in Virginia at James City County, where Williams, Williamsburg is, and I was there when uh, Bush Gardens was being built and we had, had a chance to be the first people who rode in the bucket ride. I didn't like that. <laughs> uh, but, but that's sort of the way my career unfolded in the field of public administration. And after a few years, after I had experience in both city and county government under my belt, I was asked to join a management consulting firm located in Virginia Beach, and so I did. And for seven years, I was with that firm. The unfortunate thing about it was, after the first six weeks, I decided I didn't like this at all. <laughs> that, uh, the consulting work was fine, enjoyed doing that, was fairly good at it, but I didn't like the travel, and we had to, we had to go where your clients are. And our clients were all over Virginia and North Carolina, so 
it wouldn't be unusual for me to go to, say, Pulaski County and spend a week uh, working on something that the county needed to have done, or here, or just about anywhere, uh, doing the kind of consulting work that we did. Mostly my work was in HR, but other people did financial work, and I did management reorganizations and that kind of, those sort of studies. But I didn't like it. I didn't like being away from my kids. I didn't like being away from my wife and my home where we lived in Virginia Beach. And uh, that was just a, a period of time when it was just sort of a, a sense of malaise. Uh, the kids were great. My wife was one of the greatest people I think I've ever known. Wonderful, wonderful pastor's wife. Um, but, you know, we, we met, married, had our kids, built our family. I had that career in public administration. And I just was not happy. I didn't want to go back to be a city manager again or a public administrator of any kind again. I had done that. Thank you, Lord. I'm finished. Um, and so I began to pray. And I prayed a lot. And I prayed constantly. Not just a little. I prayed and I prayed and I prayed. Over a period of seven years, I prayed virtually the same prayer. Lord, what would you have me to do? Lord, what would you have me to do? And as I would drive from my house uh, in London Bridge down to the beach borough where our office was, I, that would be my prayer. Just, Lord, what would you have me to do? Show me what you would have me to do. And in the midst of all that, we became more and more involved in the life and work of First Baptist Church in Virginia Beach. My wife and I were in the choir together. I was teaching Sunday school. I was a deacon, a uh, committee, you know, all, you know, all that stuff. And uh, so I was really, really involved in the life of the church. And that brought joy and pleasure to my life that I really didn't have in my career path. I really didn't enjoy that part. But I really, church became the thing that, that just, that was the most stimulating part of my life. And, and, and so that, that's kind of the way it was. Over the course of that seven years with those prayers every, every day, I was heading to the office one one Monday in November, and um, that was a day that we would see our new deacons and, and that sort of thing, and so it was, a, it was going to be a busy day, and uh, so on the way to the uh, office, I prayed that prayer once again, Lord, what would you have me to do? What would you have me to do? And as I drove, I sensed the presence of the Holy Spirit in such a dramatic way that I couldn't shake it loose. And in the midst of that conversation, there was a dialogue. Lord, what would you have me to do? And God said, and I heard it. Probably no one else in the car at the time would have, but I heard it. And God spoke and said, Tom, where are you happiest? And I said, gee, at church. I, I guess I'm happiest at church. And then the question came again, God, what would you have me to do? And God spoke. And he said, where are you the happiest? And I answered again, well, the church, I guess I'm the happiest in the church. And once again, the dialogue continued. God, what would you have me to do? I mean, like, what more did you need to do? Slap me around and you, what would you have me to do? And God spoke and asked me the question again. Where would you be, where would you be the happiest? Where would you have been the happiest? Where would you be the happiest? And I said, in the church. And then it dawned on me, in the church. And then their conversation ended. It was such a, a numinous moment that tears were flowing down my eyes. And I reached over and turned on the radio, which too was tuned to a Christian broadcasting station. And there was a, a song being played, just an instrumental piece, no words. And in the, in the midst of all of this, the song was being played. And the announcer came on and said, the Savior is waiting. And the, 
juxtaposition of the dialogue and the tune being announced, the Savior is waiting, was all I needed. And I responded very quickly, oh no, not that. <laughs> I had been in church long enough to know I didn't want to do that. Um, and, and, and so then I, I began to, it, it just flowed through me at that point. Tears streaming and the presence of God and the answer in that, in that hymn. And, and uh, so I, I continued on and drove to my office. And one of the other vice presidents was sitting in. He could see me as I entered the office door. And he said, Tom, come here. I said, what? He said, come here. What has happened to you? And I said, what do you mean, what's happened to me? He said, you're radiant, you're glowing, your face is glowing. I said, I, 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 I don't know what to tell you other than I, I feel like I've just been called into the ministry. And he said, well, Tom, I'm not surprised. I was surprised. <laughs> So uh, we talked for a few minutes, and he said, I just can't believe you're, you're absolutely radiant. And, and so I, I, I made excuses, went to my office, and needed to go by the church, which was a few blocks away. And our pastor had to be there that day. He wasn't usually there on Mondays, but on that Monday he was. And I was going to be elected deacon chair that evening, so he called me to the office and said, I have some personal matters I'd like to, to share with you. Um, Come on in here and sit out. Let's talk. So he shared what he had to share. And then I said, well, Jim, this was a retired Navy chaplain. Well, Jim, I think I have something I need to tell you to. And I, I told him about the experience and tears rolled up in his eyes. And uh, he said, well, Tom, I'm not surprised. <laughs> And so, as, as it turned out, his next question was, may I tell my wife? And my answer was, won't you let me tell my wife first? <laughs> because if you tell your wife, it'll be all over the church, and my wife will hear it from somebody else. <laughs> so, so with that, it was a busy day in the office, and I went by the, the, uh, the church for the deacon meeting that evening, and we had a very warm uh, experience together, probably the warmest deacon meeting I've ever attended, and the pastor asked me to tell uh, the, the story of what had happened that day, and I did. And it, it was it was just a delightful thing, very emotional, but still strong. And so I began, as I headed home, I, I began to pray, Lord, tell me what to say to Beth. What am I going to tell her? How am I going to tell her about this? How am I going to tell her that all of a sudden God spoke and everything's going to change? And so uh, I, I just prayed on that eight mile trip back home, pulled it to the driveway, went on the house, and she looked at me and she could tell something was different. And uh, my daughter was there in the den with her and watching television. And she said, well, what's, what's going on? And I said, well, I, I don't know. I don't know. Let's we'll talk about it later. I'm to put it off. And so finally we crawled into bed and Pillow talked me what it is. We were chatting along. And she said, okay, what's going on? And I said, well, I, and she said, you quit your job. <laughs> because we, I had been talking about doing that. I don't know, I was ready to sell apples on the street corner by that time. It didn't make any difference to me. So uh, I said, she said, you're going to quit your job. And I said, no. Um, you've got another job. And I said, well. She said, you're going to be a preacher. <laughs> and I said, well, Yes told her the story. I said, how did you know? And she said, because you've been buying a lot of dark suits lately. <laughs> you had to know her. <laughs> well, we laughed through that for a bit, and then she said, okay, now, what are you going to do? Well, at that point, Pat Robertson was beginning Regency University as part of the program that he had going. And I figured, well, with a public administration background and a degree in that, and, 
you know, teaching experience and you know, consulting experience and so forth, I could probably go and work at Regent University as an administrator or something like that. And she said, no, no you know, she said, no, you, you need to go to the seminary. Uh, she said, I would not respect a pastor who did not have seminary training. So let's talk about that. Well, within a few months, we had been to Southeastern Seminary at Wake Forest. We'd seen it, talked to the people, evaluated it, applied, accepted. And by the next summer, just a few months later, uh, I enrolled at uh, Southeastern Seminary. Took my wife and three kids and two cars and a mortgage, and we went down to Wake Forest. And uh, after a year, I was uh, pastor of the first church. Was called to. So that's the kind of thing that can happen when God speaks. And God spoke. And what? Everything changed. And I think that's true for all of us. When we draw close enough to be able to discern between what we think might happen and what God wants to happen, to discern between what is providence and what is just something that happened and you don't pay much attention to it. We, we come to a place where, where we almost have to, as I did, either accept it or just go mad. And there was just simply no way I could say no. And I threw up a lot of good reasons. You know, family moving, all this kind of stuff that has to happen, and I'm 38, and, and you know, we, and, and, and we have to make this change, a big change. And so we did it. My son was here yesterday. He spent a couple of days with me. And I asked him, I said, Scott, when, when I was called to the ministry, do you recall anything about that? He said, yeah. Um, I said, did, did that detrimentally affect you and the other two kids in, in any way? And he said, no. You know, we were settled there in Virginia Beach and been there a good while. My youngest son was, was born there. And... Uh, he said, no, we moved on to the seminary, we made a whole new set of friends. Went to our first church, made a whole new set of friends. He said, well, that'd be problem at all. Does that worry you? He said, you know, a parent who uproots, uproots their children and family and, you know, moves a couple hundred miles away, yeah, it, it concerned me. He said, no, absolutely not. This has been a great life for us. And uh, that really is true. It's been a great life for us. So... That's kind of what happened. We were called very clearly, almost boisterously, the Lord speaking. And when God spoke, everything changed. That happens to all of us, doesn't it? What about your experience? What about your experience of being called to Christianity? What about that time when you said yes? When you said yes to Jesus? What about that time when you were trying to figure out a career path and suddenly doors opened that you didn't expect and you passed through them? That's a kind of calling. Calling to a career, calling to school, whatever it may be. What about being called to work in the church? What about someone from the nominating committee saying, we've been praying about you and this particular job, and we think this, was a, this would be a good one for you. Will you pray with us about that? And then you begin to feel in your heart that something is moving you. Call to Christian service is exactly what I experienced. And a call to a full-time career in ministry is what I've done. But I'm not alone in that. Greg has had that experience. Judy probably has had that experience. It's, a, it's, a, it's an amazing thing that God does. And he does it relatively gently. With a sense of humor. But it's so real. It's so real. You cannot walk away. And so my career has followed a kind of an interesting path. First in the public administration field and second in ministry. And I went from a church of 500 to a church of 1,000 to a church of more than that.
And then after a period of time, I decided, well, I'd like to do something that allows me to use my talent and ability with more churches. And so the idea of potential interim ministry began to emerge. And I, I sensed the time to call, to leave the full-time installed pastor position, and then begin to do intentional interim ministry. And so if you choose to ask me to come and share with you a little bit of my life, this will be the seventh church that I have served in that capacity. And I want you to know, should you have any questions in your mind, every one of those churches is a successful church. Everyone has called a pastor who has stayed. Everyone has grown and increased their ministries. And in fact, one church grew so quickly that uh, two years ago, they dedicated a $16 million ministry center. So, intentional interim ministry works. It's been validated. It's true. It's wonderful. And it's a great way to begin to see things a little differently than perhaps you've seen them for a while. In no way does it take the place of your experience, the joy, the love, and the care that you have received over the years from long-term ministers of music and a very long-term pastor. But you are blessed for that experience, and now you can take that experience and expand your ministry to even more people who need to know how great it is to be part of the family of God Amen. in this place. We have an invitational hymn, it's number 81 in your book. I don't know if it's on the screen, but it's He Leadeth Me. And if you sing those words, think about the events in your life where you have sensed and known the leadership of Almighty God. And if you have a decision that you would like to share with us, either a decision to accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, or to say yes to God in something that you feel he's calling you to do, then why don't you come forward and Pastor Greg will be here to read you and pray with you. Let, let's stand together and sing. Number 81. I'll make it wider. I'll make it wider.